Welcome to our next presentation in the series Introduction to Beekeeping, Getting Your Bees. In this presentation I'll review basic honeybee biology. It's important to understand honeybee biology if only so that you can understand how to be a better beekeeper, provide your bees what they need when they need it, and recognize what may be going on in your hives. I'll talk about what type of bees you should get, uh, many beekeepers have very strong opinions as to what the best type of bee is. Honestly, a good bee comes in almost every type. You just have to choose which one might work best for you, uh, where you're located, and what your needs are uh, from, from your bees. I'll talk about some of the options to get, you know, from where you can get your bees from, including packaged bees, nukes, swarms, uh, full-size hives. And then I'll talk about how to introduce your bees into their new hive once uh, you have gotten them. Basic honeybee biology. The honeybee, the scientific name Apis mellifera, is a highly social insect. Uh, you know, in nature they nest in cavities, uh, typically in a hollow tree, but sometimes in um, a crevice uh, in a cliff face. Other times they might decide to nest in the wall of somebody's house. They are not native to North America. Uh, honeybees were brought here by European settlers, and they're native only to Europe, uh, Asia, and Africa. So most of the rest of the world where they occur, they were brought there by humans, uh, to the point where some of them have gone feral and now have naturalized in many of these other locations in the world. Now, a honeybee is an insect, so there are six main body parts, a head, a thorax, an abdomen. Um, they have six legs, like other insects, and uh, wings for flying. Um, a lot of folks ask about the sting, because that's, you know, non-beekeepers think about that uh, probably more. Um, yes, they can sting, but they only do that when they need to. We call that being defensive. Uh, they also have specialized... Uh, parts of their legs. There's an antenna cleaner on their front leg, uh, and on the hind leg they have uh, what they call the pollen basket or cubiculi. Um, and then of course they have antenna and eyes for uh, sensing uh, what else is going on in the, uh, in the uh, hive itself or in the environment. There are three types of bees in every colony which are called casts. Two of them are female, the queen and the worker. There's usually only one queen in a hive, although there can be exceptions, such as the bees are replacing an older queen with a younger queen. So for temporarily, there may be more than one queen in a hive, but in general, there's only one queen per hive. And she's the only bee in the colony that is fertile and can lay eggs that hatch into other workers. Uh, the worker bee is also a female, but she's unfertilized and sterile. Uh, in certain situations, she can lay eggs, but they'll be infertile eggs, non-fertilized, so, which means they only develop into drones. Drones are the male bees. Uh, they come from an unfertilized egg. So interestingly enough, they have a mother, but they do not have a father. Uh, there's only one purpose for drones, and that is mating with uh, queen bees. Uh, this occurs outside of the hive, usually on a warm summer day. And so the drones are only in the hive at certain times of the year. There may only be a few hundred, maybe... Uh, drones in a hive, uh, but this is usually only in the spring, summer, and early fall, and at other times of the year when breeding doesn't happen, uh, the drones are, are basically kicked out of the hive, uh, and new ones will be raised when spring uh, and warmer weather comes back. So like other insects, uh, honeybees develop from an egg, which then hatches into a larva, which then pupates, and eventually emerges as an adult. And the time required for the development of the type of bee, worker, queen, drone, is different depending on whether it's a, a female bee or whether it's a queen or a worker. So in general what happens is the queen lays an egg into the, one of the cells in the comb. Uh, the nurse bees feed this hatched larva. Eventually it, it reaches full growth. A worker seals its cell off and the uh, larva becomes a pupa and eventually emerges as an adult bee uh, the time that this happens, of course, uh, is different. So the queen bees are, take the shortest amount of time to develop, from egg being laid to emerging as a queen, only 16 days. A worker, which is the most numerous uh, type of bee in a hive, takes 21 days, and a drone slightly longer, 24 days. 
The number of workers in a hive really varies depending on the time of year, with more of them being present in the summer and less in the winter. So the workers can occur up to 60,000 uh, workers in a colony in the summer, or even more if it's a very strong colony. Uh, the lifespan is different depending on the summer versus the winter. In the winter, there's not much to do, uh, so the bees may live three to six months. While in the summer, uh, there's a lot of work to do, and the bees literally work themselves to death, and they might only live 21 days. Uh, the workers do all the jobs and duties in the colony. The queen bee is kind of misnamed in that she is not the leader of the colony. She basically is the mother who lays eggs. The workers decide uh, what needs to be done. Uh, if, for example, uh, they need more uh, nectar or honey, they will send out foragers to gather that. If uh, the hive needs uh, more water, they will send out specific foragers to, to go and gather water, and so on and so forth. Now in, uh, you know, there's division of labor within the hive, uh, differences between the type of female. As I mentioned, the only job of the queen is to lay eggs. She also produces queen pheromone that the colony needs uh, so that they can stick together and function as a normal, healthy, functioning colony. Uh, all, the workers perform all of the other work of the hive, uh, feeding the baby bees, uh, or what we call brood, uh, making the honeycomb, making the honey, gathering pollen and nectar, uh, pretty much everything except the one job that the queen has, which is laying eggs. The work performed by the worker bees is age dependent. So the younger bees tend to be inside the colony doing all the work that's required inside. And as the bee gets older, then it will start doing some of the more outdoor tasks. So looking at uh, you know a, a bee that has just emerged, uh, a baby worker bee, its first job is to clean out its own cell from which it emerged. Um, it starts feeding larvae and becomes a nurse bee around a week old or so. Uh, then it does other tasks, uh, building honeycomb. Uh, when foragers come in with nectar, they may regurgitate the nectar into one of the house bees that's waiting for them. So the forager can go out and uh, go back out and get more. Uh, other jobs include guarding the hive. And then later, once it's old enough, then it'll start uh, leaving the hive to forage for nectar, pollen, water, uh, or other things. So the first job of a worker bee from day one through around age 12 or so uh, is being a nurse bee. So it cleans out the cells, it feeds the brood, or the, what, we, what we call the, the baby bees. Um, and it does this for the first part of its life. Later, when it's a little bit older, starting around day 10 or so, it becomes a house bee. So it's no longer necessarily feeding the, the baby bees or the brood. Um, these time frames are not fixed, however, if for some reason more brood is raised and they need more nurse bees, an older bee can sort of regress and start doing a task that is, you know, at a younger age than it normally would. It doesn't do it quite as well as a younger bee would, but it, it can uh, regress if it needs to. And the same thing can happen in the other way, too. If, if for some reason there's not enough older bees out foraging, a younger bee can actually uh, advance and act as if it's an older bee um, sooner than it would otherwise. Some of the tasks of the house bees include secreting wax and building the comb for brood or honey, cleaning the hive, waiting for uh, the foragers to come back and accepting nectar from the foragers. Uh, the foragers tend to put the pollen in uh, to the comb itself so the house bees don't exactly accept it, but they do work with it once that pollen is put into the comb um, and make that pollen into, say, bee bread. Uh, there's a very specific job task, undertaker bees, which their only task is to remove bees that happen to die outside of the hive. Uh, later, they, they move towards the entrance and begin guarding the hive from any threat, whether it's human or another predator. And also, they keep the temperature within the hive at the ideal uh, temperature. Um, the brood nest will be warm, uh, usually around 92 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Uh, and they'll do this even in the wintertime when it might be cold outside by uh, clustering together and generating heat. And then later, uh, finally, uh, the last job of the worker bee as it gets older from about 20 days old uh, until it finally dies of old age is to leave the hive uh, to harvest nectar, pollen, water, plant resins such as propolis. Um, it's very interesting, the language of these bees. They will come back to the hive and tell the other bees uh, the location of these resources by dancing. Uh, Carl von Frisch uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize for learning about this dance language and interpreting it. And if you uh, see bees dancing on the comb and you understand uh, what it means, you can have a general idea of where that, that 
source is located uh, both direction and distance wise from the hive. The drones or male bees. You know, I've, I've heard some beekeepers say, oh, the drones, they don't do anything. They're a bunch of lazy bums. Uh, they're just freeloaders. Well, you can't really look at it from a human perspective. You know, the drones have a very important job, and that is to mate with the queen bees so that they can produce the next generation of, of bees. Uh, if there were no drones, then there would be no bees. And so their job is so important that the only job is basically to fly out to certain areas, which we call drone congregation areas, where the virgin queens instinctively know to fly on a warm summer day uh, so that they can mate. And a virgin queen will mate, on average, with 12 to 14 drones, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, in the process of mating, however, the drone's endophallus is ripped from his body, so the drone will fall to the ground and die. Now, most drones do not mate, so they eventually just die of old age um, after a few weeks. Uh, they do not have a stinger. So the stinger in the, the queen or in the worker is a modified ovipositor, and since the drone is a male bee and not a female bee, it does not have an ovipositor, so it does not have a stinger. Uh, you can... Uh, pick drones up literally um, with your bare hands they won't sting you and the other interesting thing about drone bees unlike other animals where you know there's an XX or an XY chromosome to determine the sex of a of, of an animal uh, with with bees it's basically uh, if it's an unfertilized egg and only has a half of a set of chromosomes only from its mother that will be a drone bee or a male bee uh, whereas if it gets two set if the egg gets two sets of chromosomes uh, for a fertilized egg, uh, that will become a female, and most commonly a worker, uh, or if it is treated uh, properly by the bees, it can develop into a queen. But the drone bees, it's very interesting. They have a mother, but because they're from an unfertilized egg, they do not have a father. And then finally, there's the queen, and she's the only fertile female within the hive. Uh, even though the egg that she developed from potentially could have been a worker egg she developed into a queen due to differences in how the workers treated her they fed her much more uh, amounts of a secretion called royal jelly while a larva she emerges much earlier than any other type of bee uh, at day 16 uh, when she is mated and laying uh, she will uh, lay up to 1500 eggs per day uh, in the springtime through early summer she secretes chemicals called pheromones, which help the bees recognize her as queen and also help the colony uh, stay together uh, as a functioning uh, a colony. Uh, she can live up to two to four years. Not all queens will live quite that long. So when do, the, when do bees raise a new queen? They will raise a new queen under certain specific situations. If the queen dies suddenly, they can raise a new queen from any fertilized egg. Um, perhaps the queen got old, or perhaps the beekeeper was sloppy and they accidentally squashed her, or was doing something other, um, something else with the hive, and somehow the queen was lost or died. If the queen is um, getting older and she's uh, coming to the end of her lifespan, they can do something called supersedure, where they will raise a new queen to replace their older original queen. And then finally, in the springtime, uh, it's normal for hives to want to reproduce. So the colony uh, will want to form another colony, and uh, they will raise a queen, or raise queens, uh, and the older queen, along with approximately half of the bees, will leave the hive, cluster it temporarily in a tree or a bush while they look for a new place to have their nest. Um, you know, in nature, it usually would be in a hollow tree, but, you know, nowadays it could be anywhere, even within the wall of a house or a building. As soon as the queen, first queen emerges from her cell, and queen cells look a little bit like a, like a peanut um, on the comb, as soon as she emerges, she will seek out the cells of her sister queens and kill them all if she can in order to avoid having to fight them to the death. But if two queens emerge at the same time, they will fight to the death. There can be only one queen in a hive, uh, with only a few uh, exceptions. After a few days, she will go on her mating flight, uh, roughly five to seven days after she emerges, usually mating with an average of 12 or 14 drones, but it can be more or slightly less. And after about three days or so, she'll begin laying eggs and begin uh, the rest of her life, which is basically the mother of all the bees in the colony, 
um, and basically an egg-laying machine. So the more eggs she lays, the more bees there are in the colony. So what type of bees should you get? Well, obviously we are talking about honeybees, of course, and not other types of bees. But even among Apis mellifera, the honeybee, there are many types of bees uh, and options for bees. We call these ecotypes or strains of honeybee or, or even races of honeybee. Uh, and there's a lot of overlap, but there's many different types, and uh, they can differ in the color and appearance, how defensive they are. Uh, you know, if when you open the hive, um, do they come out and try to sting you, or are they pretty calm and gentle and kind of ignore you? Uh, how much honey do they produce? Hygienic behavior, uh, how clean do they keep the hive, which is an important behavior for disease management and prevention. Um, how adapted are they to northern environments and winter hardiness, uh, tolerance to varroa mites and other types of mites? So here are some examples of the different types of bees available to some beekeepers. Uh, the Italian was originally brought into the United States. Uh, the original honeybees that were brought to the United States in the 1600s were what we call the German black bee, uh, Apis mellifera mellifera. And those really don't exist. Um, maybe uh, in some small feral populations, some of their genetics are, are still present, but not in the pure strain that was originally brought over. Um, and so the Italian bee were brought over. Um, then other strains include the Russian, uh, New World Carniolan, uh, Old World Carniolan, Caucasian, uh, VSH, which is more of a, a genetic uh, trait for a mite resistance, Minnesota Hygienics, uh, the buckfast, um, and then what we call sometimes mutt bees or mixed bees, basically whatever crosses have happened uh, to any of the, the bees of these other types. And you know, you have to understand that when queen bees mate, they mate with whatever male bee or drone is flying in the area. So it really is difficult unless you're doing, uh, you know, instrumental insemination of queen bees to really control that or you're in an isolated place such as in a mountain valley or on an island. So of all the options to choose from, you know, which is best? And if you ever go to a beekeeping meeting or club and ask what's the best type of bee, you're going to get a lot of strong opinions about what is the best type of bee. And honestly, bees come in many types. With no one best type for all beekeepers in all situations. I mean, think about it with cattle. What's the best type of cow? Well, maybe, maybe this kind if you want to make lots of milk. Or maybe this kind if you uh, intend on raising beef. Or then there's this kind if you're going to live in a you know southern uh, or tropical area. Or then there's this kind, the Texas Longhorn. Or maybe if you're up north, you might want a Scotch Highland. These are all useful breeds of cattle. And which one is best really depends on what you like, what you want, and uh, you know what you're planning to do with them. Bees are are like this in many ways. Uh, there really is no one best uh, type of bee. So some of the traits that beekeepers breed for include gentleness. We don't want our bees to sting us. We like them to be calm on the comb, uh, not what we call runny, running all over the place. I mean, I've had bees where maybe they weren't stinging a lot, but they were very nervous and ran all over rather, as compared to, uh, you know, putting the comb down uh, on the side of the hive while you're doing a hive inspection and they just stay there and don't move. We obviously... Most of us would prefer not to have bees like this. This is a photo of Af what Africanized bees can do when you uh, work with them. Personally, I like to be able to check uh, my bees, uh, you know, on uh, on a nice warm summer day and not necessarily have to wear a bee suit. We look at brood pattern. You know, you want a colony that raises lots and lots of bees. The, the faster it builds up, the more bees that it produces, the higher the population, the more bees you have available to make uh, honey. Uh, brood uh, production and colony population are strongly correlated to with honey production later on. And then there's mite and disease resistance. You know, the Varroa mite has really affected, uh, you know, beekeeping. We didn't have to worry about this a few decades ago, and now as a beekeeper, you have to be on top of mites or you will lose hives. And so maybe you'll select uh, the breeds, the, the type of bees you breed from by looking at how many mites drop from the hive. Or you might look at hygienic behavior. This is after uh, having killed brood uh, with liquid nitrogen. And you can look, almost all of these cells have been removed. There's just like two or three of them left that the bees didn't remove. So this, has, this colony has strong expression of hygienic behavior. 
And then there's certain types of uh, bees that will actually, uh, honeybees that tend to uh, bite uh, or groom the uh, mites off of their other bees. And these traits can all be useful for managing uh, varroa mites. Of course, there is honey production, uh, how many pounds of honey uh, is harvested. There can be a difference in what the comb looks like, you know, the dry comb versus wet comb. And what I mean is you have those beautiful white cappings uh, like like the top photo or you have where the honey actually touches the wax. And it, and there's nothing wrong with the honey. This is purely cosmetic. But if you're someone who, let's say, is producing comb honey or cut comb honey, you might want to have the t uh, bees that tend to make honey that leave that little bit of air gap between the surface and the honey and the wax. So it, it just looks prettier. Overwintering ability. Uh, you know, maybe if you're in the south, this is not as important for you. But if you have bees up north, like where I do, it is important that they can survive, uh, you know, through the winter. And then also frugality. That's basically how much honey do they eat. You can have two different hives survive, but one might just go through a lot of honey. And you might have to feed them a lot more in order for them to survive the winter. Whereas a colony that is more frugal... Uh, you might not have to uh, feed very much, and they might have lots of leftover honey by the time spring arrives. So not only will I, as a bee breeder, select for those that can overwinter well, but also those that are frugal with their stores and don't burn through them as fast as other uh, bees might. Do they prefer swarming versus supersedure? Now, all bees will swarm, but if they have an older queen that needs to be replaced, will they simply replace her through supersedure? Or will they decide to swarm at the same time? You can select for uh, strains of bees that are less likely to swarm as compared to others. Of course, again, all, all honeybees will swarm given the proper conditions. Pollen gathering ability. Um, you know, this is important not so much only for pollination, but bees that bring in and save a lot of pollen will have this pollen available for times of the year when, say, pollen is not available, like late winter when the hives start building up. The longevity of the queen. I know some bee breeders select uh, for queens from colonies where the queen has lived a long time. It means the colony obviously is healthy and the queen was healthy and vigorous. Some of the other traits uh, you might breed for if, if they're very responsive to stimulative feeding, whether it's uh, sugar syrup or, or protein supplement. Um, you know, why would you want that? Uh, you know, a hive that has a large hive population year round. Well, if you're going to take your bees out to California to pollinate, you know, when the rest of the country is, you know, in late winter, you might want to have bees that will respond to this feeding and keep a large hive population available. Um, perhaps if you're a bee uh, producer, you're producing packaged bees or nukes, you might also want bees that have a large population and will produce a lot of bees. Some beekeepers select against propolis. Uh, propolis is a resin that the bees gather and put in the hive, and a hive that has lots of propolis uh, can be a little bit harder for the bees to work. But on the other hand, this might help the bees be more resistant to certain diseases. So perhaps breeding out propolis gathering so they don't produce or gather as much might be a, a maybe not so good for the bees themselves, even though it might be uh, easier for the beekeeper. And then color, you know, some of us prefer darker bees, um, some of us prefer lighter bees, and this is purely cosmetic, honestly. Um, the color of the bee doesn't really matter so much. But um, yeah, some of us will breed for the color of the type of bee. Now here's a chart showing the quote unquote breeds of honeybees, but what I wanna point out is these are not really breeds the way we might think of a breed of dog or a breed of chicken. There's a lot of overlap between the different kinds of bees. So rather than calling them a breed, I might might say the strain or the subspecies or the, the ecotype. Um, some of the older beekeepers, we would use the term race because uh, referring to the color or how the bee looks. Um, you, you can use whatever words you want to describe the strain or the type of bee. Um, but just be aware, there can be a lot of overlap between the different uh, types of, of bees. They're not quite as clear-cut as in breeds of uh, livestock or dogs or, or poultry. The Italians. These are a very popular bee. Uh, these are light in color. Uh, the queen is light golden, so she's much easier to find, say, than some of the darker bees. They originally were brought to the U.S. from Italy in the mid-1800s. Before that, we only had the German uh, black bee or dark bee. Uh, they're the most common honeybee uh, strain in the U.S. They're excellent honey producers. They tend to be gentle. Uh, they don't tend to swarm more than other types of bees. 
Uh, they do produce a large brood nest with a large population year-round. You know, remember, they evolved and came originally from the Mediterranean, where the winters were really not that cold. And so they may or may not do as well wintering in cold climates. Although I have had strains of Italian bees that were northern bred and raised and selected for winter ability. So, uh, you know, this is a generalization. Uh, Italians can winter well also if they're treated appropriately. Uh, negative, they tend to like to rob other uh, bees out more, and they, they tend to not be as uh, oriented on their location of the hive, so they may drift. The Minnesota Hygienics were uh, selected from strains of Italians. They were developed by the University of Minnesota from lines of Italian bees. Uh, the, the Starline hybrid that was being produced back in the 70s and 80s were some of the foundation uh, bees for this strain. And they were selected for increased hygienic behavior and wintering ability. So this hygienic behavior provides resistance to brood diseases such as chalkboard, or chalk brood or European uh, fowl brood. Uh, they have better wintering ability as compared to uh, non-selected Italian strains because these were uh, selected in Minnesota. Uh, they're excellent honey producers, although some beekeepers say they are a little bit more defensive uh, than some of the other strains. And similar to Italians, they can drift and rob more than maybe some of the other strains. So the, the Cordovans are not so much a different strain but a, a different color, and it's due to a genetic strain trait so it's not really a subspecies or, or a strain but a recessive mutation it was originally developed uh, for research to look at the breeding behavior of honeybees but some beekeepers just like the color and because the queens are easier to find and they just think they're pretty and so uh, you know what other qualities or characteristics will depend on what strain you know what type of bee they originally came from and this color can be found in, in all different types of bees but the ones from the Italians can be bright yellow other races may be more of a purple color And then we have the Cardiolans. These are the, probably the second most common or popular type of bee in the U.S. They do tend to be darker, so the queens are a little bit harder to find. And they originally came from Central and Eastern Europe, from Austria, Slovenia, and Hungary. Uh, they're very gentle. I love my uh, Cardiolans. I can open them on a warm summer day during the honey flow, and they, they pretty much ignore me. Um, whereas other types of bees, I maybe better not do that without putting on my veil and my bee jacket. Uh, some strains may have increased swarming, although uh, if handled properly, I find that they don't tend to swarm necessarily more than other types of bees. Uh, they're very responsive to changes in floral resources, so they will shut down brood rearing fairly quickly as soon as pollen stops coming in. Um, they're frugal, they don't overuse stores over the winter, and they tend to winter very well in cold climates. Then you have the Caucasians. Uh, these uh, are dark bees as well. They originally came from the Caucasus Mountains in the Republic of Georgia in the former Soviet Union. Uh, they're also extremely gentle. Um, the most gentle strain of bees there are, they winter well. Uh, they do tend to use more propolis than other strains, and they seem to be more willing than other strains to forage during cooler temperature uh, as a result of having originally been from high mountain areas. They have a longer tongue than some other strains and may be able to take advantage of more uh, diverse nectar resources as compared to other strains. And then you have the Russians. So these are more variable. Um, these were originally transported across Russia to, uh, to eastern Russia in the Primorsky region. Uh, but they were the first honeybees, European honeybees, to be exposed to varroa mites. And so because they had been exposed to them for much longer than other European honeybees, they have evolved traits that allow them to be more resistant. Um, they are sensitive to changes in floral resources, similar to the Carniolans and Caucasians, and so they will shut down brood rearing fairly quickly. But they do winter very well in northern climates. Uh, they do build up very rapidly in the spring, so if you are not managing that, they can be prone to swarming. Now, some beekeepers say they can be more defensive than others and not so much. Uh, I find they're not very defensive, but if you cross them with an unrelated strain, that first cross can sometimes be more defensive than, say, a 100% purebred Russian. Then you have the Buckfast. They tend to be variable in color. Uh, they're a strain that was selected by Brother Adam of Buckfast Abbey in England from a number of other types of strains and subspecies of honeybees. Uh, they were bred to be tolerant of tracheal mites. They do very well being from England. Uh, they do well in cold, wet climates. Uh, they're gentle. They're hard to find in the U.S. Uh, there have been breeders in the U.S. selling Buckfast, but they're probably not true Buckfast. But there are breeders of pure Buckfast in Europe and also in Canada. 
So the varroa sensitive hygiene, it's variable depending on the base strain. Uh, it's not really a strain, but rather a trait that has been selected for by bee breeders. Uh, basically, these bees are able to detect and remove brood afflicted with varroa mites. And because of that, there's a lower rate of mite reproduction. And so they're more tolerant. It's not that they're completely resistant. They may require mite treatments, but it takes longer for the varroa mite population to build up to a point uh, where it's a problem and where the, the hive might need to be treated. Um, if you get a pure bed varroa and then raise uh, queens off of her, which cross with some of your local bees, then she'll only be 50% VSH, but that those colony of bees that have 50% uh, expression still have a fair amount of resistance to varroa or tolerance of varroa mites. Then, of course, we have the Africanized bees. Um, these, are, uh, these exist in the southern United States uh, through Central and South America. Uh, they were introduced to Brazil, hoping to improve uh, the ability of bees to, to, to tolerate tropical regions. The hope was that uh, some of the unpleasant uh, behaviors, the excess defensiveness and swarmingness, would be uh, bred out because of the pre-existing European bees. But it turned out that did not happen. It turned out that they were so successful in the tropics that they eventually um, outbred all of the European honeybees within South America, uh, Central America, and Southern United States. With a few exceptions, uh, you know, in, in the higher mountain regions of, the, of South America, such as the Andes, they still have European bees in those elevations. Um, they're originally from the tropics, and so they do not form a winter cluster, which is why they probably can only exist only so far north before uh, the European bees will, will take over. Um, they can be very productive, but the, and the, and the problem is they're very defensive, and so that's why we really don't recommend keeping them. Although I know beekeepers, uh, places like South Texas and Arizona that, that know how to work with them and just keep them in a you know, remote location away from people or livestock. This is certainly not the kind of bee you're going to put in your suburban backyard. I mean, they're going to be dangerous and you know, sting people or you know, potentially kill the neighbor's dog or whatnot. But always remember that you know, good honeybees come in every race and every strain and every ecotype, but so do the bad ones. Uh, you know, the Carniolans, for example, are supposed to be very gentle, but I've had some very hot, defensive, mean Carniolan hives. Those are the exception, but, and the same thing, Italians are supposed to be very productive uh, honeybees, but I've had Italians that really weren't very productive. There is a lot of overlap between, you know, the good and the, and the not-so-good uh, characteristics of the various types of bees. Sometimes, if you don't have an option, you might just have to get what's available. Maybe you want a Carniolan, and the only source that you can get happens to be Italian, that's not a big deal. You can always requeen later with a carniolan bee like the following year if that's what you want. So what are the sources of honeybees? Uh, well, you're starting out as a new beekeeper and you need to get some bees. You bought your bee equipment. Uh, it's painted. It's put together. It's all ready. Uh, uh, one option are packaged bees. Another is uh, nukes. Uh, there are swarms or you could even purchase a full size hive. For years, we've used package bees. Uh, basically, this is a, a shook swarm of bees with a queen in a cage, um, a syrup feeder. Uh, they have been shipped through the mail. Uh, because they do not include the comb or brood, they're less expensive, but they do tend to have a higher rate of failure, and uh, sometimes the queens will be replaced. Uh, you need to begin putting orders in early. So, you know, if it's April or May and you want to get bees, it might be too late. You're going to have to put in orders uh, in starting in January for many uh, package bee suppliers. Uh, then there are what we call nukes. I've heard some people mispronounce this as a nuc, but it's a nuke is short for nucleus, and that's why we call it a nuke. And basically, a nucleus colony or a nuke is a small colony of bees complete with queen, brood, four or five frames of drawn comb. They are more expensive than packages, but they're much more likely to be successful because you already have a colony of bees established that can expand into new into more of your uh, you know your comb. There is a risk of of diseased comb, you know, American fowl brood, um, and because of that, these really should be inspected uh, and, and certified. Uh, they they tend they're not really able to be shipped, so if you want to get nukes, you're going to have to probably drive somewhere to pick them up. They might be brought in, you know, say from California or Texas on a truck. Uh, you know, maybe your bee club can bring them in. Um, or a bee supplier. Uh, but if you can find them, uh, nukes are often the best way to begin. You, you very likely have the strongest chance of success um, as compared to starting out with a package bee. But if you can't get, uh, get a nuke or find a nuke, packages can work just fine also. 
Then there are swarms. So every year swarms uh, uh, leave a hive, and if you can catch them and put them in a hive, uh, you, you have a hive. Uh, but there is some luck and skill involved, so this might be something that if you're going to want to start out with a swarm, you might ask a established, experienced beekeeper to help you out um, to show you how to catch the swarm and put it in a hive. Uh, many of us did start out and build our colony count by capturing uh, wild swarms, uh, and the bees are free. You don't have to pay anything for them, but there is a luck involved. You know, they're not just hanging in trees everywhere you go. You, you know, there is luck in finding them um, and then capturing them. And this old saying, a swarm of bees in May is worth a load of hay. A swarm of bees in June is worth a silver spoon. A swarm of bees in July ain't worth a fly. Uh, basically, a swarm caught earlier in the summer uh, has enough time to build up and form an established colony, but by later in the summer, there won't be enough time, and uh, you know they might not amount to anything, or they might not even survive the winter. So the disadvantages, again, as I mentioned, luck is involved. You don't know what the genetics are of these bees. Um, you know, and they could be full of mites or something else. And then finally, you could purchase a full-size hive from an established beekeeper. It's likely to produce honey the first year, uh, but it's also the most expensive. Um, and then the other thing, too, is, you know, starting out with packages or a, or a nuke, you as a beekeeper can, a new beekeeper, can build your skills uh, as the colony itself develops. But, you know, going into a strong, established colony, you open it up and the bees start boiling out over the sides of the hive and they're crawling everywhere and flying everywhere. It can be very intimidating if you're a brand new beekeeper who doesn't have any experience. Um, but if you have a mentor or someone who can help you out and show you what to do and you're willing to spend the money, uh, buying a full-size hive or even a single deep uh, box hive, um, you know, that can that can be a good way to start also. I often, uh, you know, hear brand new beekeepers, you know, we know of a wild hive in a house or in a tree, and I want to get those and put them in a hive. Um, just be aware, it, it, it can be challenging to do that. Uh, you know, cutting the feral colony out uh, or, or even out of a wall of a house, you know, you can damage the house and you can actually end up killing the bees if you don't know what you're doing. It really is a specialized skill. And if you try to get the bees out and, and put them in a hive and you don't save the queen, you know, you might just end up, instead of getting yourself a, a colony of uh, wild bees, you may basically have just killed the colony. I've, I hear stories about this. Brand new beekeepers, you know, deciding that they watched a couple of YouTube videos and now they're going to cut out a, a colony from a tree or a wall of a house. And they end up just killing the colony because they didn't really have the skill set to succeed at doing this. Well, okay, let's say you've decided to purchase your nuke or your package bees. Uh, now they've come, and now it's time to put them into your hive. Sometimes they come in the mail. Other times they may uh, come, you know, delivered. If you if you have to have them ride out outdoor in the back of a pickup truck, we recommend covering them with a tarp to keep the wind off of them. Um, if it's snowing or cold, you might have to keep them for a day or so inside a, you know, a, a garage or or something like that. Well, the first thing you do when you get the packages is you pry apart the uh, the packages so they're all individual. First, we get the syrup can out. First, we get the syrup can. We're prying. So, so the next thing you do is you remove this the can that has this the the syrup for the packages. You pry it up loosely with your hive tool and then gently rock it and bring it out, being very carefully so that you don't accidentally squish any bees First we get the syrup and the queen out. cage should be located to the side next to where the syrup can is located and then finally you pull the queen cage from the uh, from the package bees um, and as you notice th these bees have nothing to defend so they're usually uh, fairly docile uh, you know as a new beekeeper may want to use gloves um, but you need to look inside that cage uh, that's and to make sure the queen is alive and I can tell by the way these bees are acting that the queen in this cage is alive and the bees have accepted her. You can see that little wing flick the one bee is doing. And then they put the queen cage into the hive where you're about to put the bees. Uh, there's different ways of doing that. Usually the queen cage will have a little bit of candy and you need to remove the cork or the covering over this candy so the bees have access to it and can slowly nibble away and gnaw through the candy uh, eventually release the queen in a few days. It's important that the mesh faces outward and is in contact with the bees. 
um, so that they can feed her. Because if you just cover this up, put the the the, the mesh facing the wrong way out, or not not facing out but facing inward, uh, she won't have access, and they won't be able to feed her, and she could theoretically die before they release her. Another way is you could just uh, rubber band it to the face of the comb, or sometimes just wedge it. You know, and the mesh is facing downward towards the. Uh, towards the comb so the bees can come up from below and feed her and care for her until they eventually release her. Now if there's package bees you you can now dump them. You can dump them on top of the hive if you want. Uh, prefer to per put a gap on the side of the hive and dump the bees that way um, and then re slowly replace the frames afterwards. Now with nukes, of course, uh, the bees are already on the comb, and so you're not going to dump them in. What you're going to do is basically carefully remove these frames. The queen is already walking on the comb laying eggs, and so you have to be very careful that you don't accidentally squash her or injure her as you're putting And so then you put the, those combs into your new hive and put the other frames with, uh, with foundation adjacent to it. Um, and then you put them all snug together and make sure, again, not to crush or injure the queen as you're doing this... Uh, Trans, uh, transferring from the nuke box into your hive. So the first few weeks uh, you've put the bees into the new hive and what you should expect is they should release, if it's a package bee, of course, package bees, not a nuke, they should release the queen from the queen cage. Uh, so you should come back and, and check to make sure she was released after a few days and if not you can you can help uh, manually release her but be careful because queens, you know, they have been known to fly off. Uh, so it's always best for them to release it on her own, um, but if it's been like several days, then you can you can manually release her, but just be very careful. The, you should be feeding the bees sugar syrup uh, so that they can draw out wax and begin building new comb, especially for a brand new beekeeper in which there's foundation only. They don't have any comb, so they need to begin drawing out new comb, um, and she should begin laying eggs. What can happen, though, if... Uh, you know, is she, the queen could have died, or the, the sometimes package bees will simply abscond. They'll just fly away. Uh, they could starve if there's not enough food, or they could begin robbing each other out, or there could be poorly drawn comb. So in the first week, after you've introduced your package bees into their new hive, you should come back about two to four days after you've put the package in there to make sure that the queen was released from her cage, um, and then remove the empty queen cage uh, from where it was and push the frames together and close up the hive. Uh, it's important to push the frames together so the bees don't start drawing comb uh, where the queen cage was because then it's a little bit more of a mess to remove. Um, and if the queen has not been released, poke a small hole in the candy portion um, or just remove the cork and let her walk out. But again, be careful so that she doesn't uh, fly off on you. And this is why you should take the queen cage out um, after a period of time because they will begin building comb in the empty space and it can be a real mess to clean. So all new colonies should be fed sugar syrup. They need a source of carbohydrates for energy and also to secrete wax so they can draw out new comb from your foundation. So at first feed your new colony as much uh, syrup as it will take. Within the first few weeks after introducing your bees into their new hive, they should begin drawing out new comb from the foundation. If you're starting out with a 100% foundation, as most of us do, uh, they'll require a huge input of energy, so you'll have to feed them a lot of syrup uh, until there's natural uh, honey coming in. If you happen to have disease-free old comb from colonies that had died the previous year, you can certainly give that to them. It'll give them a head start. They don't have to spend as much energy or time uh, to uh, draw as if as if they're drawing out new foundation. Now as soon as the queen is released she should begin laying eggs uh, within a few days uh, after having been released. Uh, package bees are really under a timeline because they have to draw out new comb. The queen has to begin laying eggs to replace the population as the bees begin aging and dying. Now these eggs can be a little bit hard to see if it's a light colored or a yellow foundation it's a lot easier if you use the dark uh, plastic foundation, which uh, for people with old eyes like me, I much prefer this. You can really see those eggs. They, they contrast very nicely to the bottom of that foundation. A few days later, if you look, you should see larva forming and brood. And eventually some capped brood should begin developing. Well, what can go wrong? So, uh, absconding or drifting 
So in the first week after you put package bees in, sometimes the whole colony can just fly off. They might not like your what you had given them. Um, another problem that's probably more common is they can drift, so they're not really sure where their new home is, and so they might drift uh, to different hives. Uh, so you might end up with one or two hives that are very strong, and the other one's not strong at all. So some of the things you can do when you're putting package bees into a new colony, or into a new hive, is put them into their new hive in the evening. They're less likely to drift or abscond. Maybe put some glass loosely into the entrance and then remove it the next day. Try to lay out your hives uh, so they're facing in different directions, and don't put them in long rows. They can recognize their hive much easier if the hives are facing in different directions. Uh, some people like to paint their hives different colors or put patterns on them. Um, it doesn't matter, but any way that you can make it so the bees can more easily recognize which hive is which will keep them from drifting between the hives. So that brings us to the conclusion of this presentation. So you've decided to get bees and become a beekeeper. What do you need to do next? Well, first, decide what uh, type of bees you like to get. Uh, perhaps you might only have one or two choices, maybe Italians or Carniolans. Find a supplier and order your bees. Uh, many suppliers are already sold out by January, so as soon as you realize that you like to get bees, it's important to put that order in. And if you decide in the springtime, maybe it's best to wait a year. Uh, try to learn as much as you can during that summer and fall and then order your bees the following year. Order your equipment and supplies. Build and paint it. Uh, many of us beekeepers do that during the off season, during the winter. Try to choose a location where you'd like to put those hives. And try to read and learn as much as you can before you get your bees. There's so many who post on the forums online or on social media and they're, they, they say, help me, I got bees and I, I don't know what to do. Uh, you know, they should have kind of learned about that as much as possible before they actually got their bees. Um, of course, once you get them, there will be things you see or you don't understand or, or things that are not exactly the way it is in any book because the bees, well, they, they don't read the bee books that us humans uh, write. Well, thank you for watching Introduction to Beekeeping. Uh, I hope you uh, learn from some of the other presentations we have. Uh, in this series of presentations.